Welcome. We outside the land of Israel read Parshat Pinchas this week. And although I thought we were in sync with Israel, I found out we're not yet in sync. We're still a week behind, but in any event, where we are, we are. The title of this class is Carrying Our Values Forward. And it's not a simple statement to make, why? Because as we look into this week's Torah reading, we'll see that within our own values system, one value can contradict another. And oftentimes we can be passing forward the motivation and a value that is really contrary or much less important to us than the one we intend to. So let's look at this Parsha. Just as an overview, Parsha Pinchas takes place at the very end of the Torah's narrative. We're really in the 40th year already of the Jewish people having left Egypt. And what it occupies itself with is the aftermath of the act of zealotry of Pinchas, the, where the Parsha is named after. Pinchas was a grandson of Aaron, Moshe's brother, who took action and killed a prince of the Jewish people who was publicly cohabiting with the offspring of Midian as a way of defying the whole holiness of the Jewish people. And he's rewarded by being elevated to being a Kohen like his grandfather Aaron. And it's considered a breach shalom, a covenant of peace. And we'll get back to that at the later point in the class. Census is taken. We took it to talk about new leadership, the apportioning of the land and the complaint of the daughters of Tzalovcha that they wouldn't have a portion. And then the appointment of Joshua as the successor leader to Moshe Rabbeinu, although it doesn't take place immediately. There are several months of narrative left, but it's described here as if it did take place. And apparently, according to the Ramban, in any event, it really only takes place on the very last day of Moshe's life. And then it lists the offerings for the different holidays. And therefore, this portion is read, sections of it are read in each of the holidays, Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, throughout the year. People who have this for their bar mitzvah portion end up being able to read on many, many holiday portions throughout the year taken from this section. And what, of course, do these offerings have to do with? So the common theme here is a forward-looking theme, door the door, generation and generation, moving things forward. In other words, we see how, El, El, how Pinchas, who would not have been a Kohen, he is a grandson of Aaron, but for technical reasons, he would not have been a Kohen, is elevated to the status of a Kohen. And in fact, we know by tradition that he himself morphs over the centuries into Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the priest, as the defender of God's honor amongst the Jewish people forever. The census is preparation for entering the land. The apportioning of the land is preparation for the Jewish people settling there and the next generation taking over from the generation that has already passed away in the wilderness. And the offerings themselves provide the merit for the Jewish people to remain in the land and retain their holy stature. So that's the continuity and the unity of purpose and theme of this week's Torah reading. And indeed, if you look at the back in the art scroll on that final page where it gives you the mnemonic for the Torah portion of Pinchas, it's on page 899. It tells you there's 168 verses, and one of them is lech to divide up, and it doesn't mean just dividing up the land. It means doing everything necessary for a new leader, the offerings, and preparing the future course of Jewish life. And that's the sense of this Parsha being a very forward-looking Parsha. And therefore, as we look at it together, what we need to consider is what are the real values that are being transmitted and which values are not being transmitted? And I want to say that that's a very difficult thing. And I'll just use an example. 
for people who grow up reading the press in Israel, almost without fail, the only time that the religious community is represented is when they're protesting, is when a statement is made by an elderly sage saying that we should understand that there's justice in all of God's ways, even in an event like the Holocaust. These grab the headlines because they fit into the stereotype that the world is most comfortable with about religious, very religious, Haredi, whatever word you want to use to make yourself comfortable, people. <laughs> It's the stereotype that they're judgmental, they look down on you, they're not your friends. If you wander into their neighborhoods, they're gonna be scrutinizing you as an other. What are you doing here? And that of course reinforces the whole concept of media, which is to chop and dice and divide and show distinctions, but ultimately pander to a sense that rather than the old fashioned idea of I'm okay, you're okay, it's I'm okay, I don't really know about you. And building these kind of walls and divisions. And of course it would be easy to misconstrue this Torah reading that way and we'll see how the sources of the rabbis deal with it. But let's move right to chapter 27, sentence 15, if you're following in the art scroll Chumash, that's on page 888, 889. And that to me is a very dramatic few sentences in which Yoshua know, sure, Joshua is designated to become the successor of Moshe. And of course, what it means ultimately is that Moshe is not permitted by God's decree to fulfill his mission that he accepted at the burning bush, which was to bring the Jewish people from slavery to Mount Sinai and receive the Torah and then through to the ultimate freedom of settling in the land God has designated for the Jewish people, promise to Abraham, promise to Isaac, promise to Jacob, and see them rooted there so that there could be true Jewish continuity carrying forward the ultimate purest values of the Jewish people. But instead, things are messy and things stuff happens and there are setbacks. And that generation dies in the wilderness. And indeed, Moshe himself, we don't know where he's buried, Moshe himself doesn't isn't able to fulfill his mission. And he turns over leadership to Yehoshua, to Joshua, his designated successor. And we know from the very end of the Torah and from the book of Joshua, how Joshua leads the Jewish people into the land of Israel, fights the battles, conquers the land, ultimately apportions the land, and sees to it that the Jewish people spread out, not completely, but within the confines of the land of Israel promised to them, and they each tribe is rooted in its place. And of course, this is way before Yerushalayim is conquered. It doesn't happen for many generations till the time of King David, but at least the Jewish people at this point, when Joshua completes his tenure of leadership, the mission of Moshe Rabbeinu, so to speak, is completed. And we, the Jewish people, have been redeemed from bondage. We've been elevated at Mount Sinai and charged with fulfillment of the Torah. We successfully transitioned, crossing the Jordan River and settling in the confines of the land promised to us by God as being the ultimate place in the world for the Jewish people to thrive. And we settle within the land. Okay, to, like always with mixed results, but at least it launches the enterprise of B'nai Yisrael, of the descendants of Israel, living in the land in Eretz Israel in the land of Israel. Let's look at these sentences here. It's chapter 27, sentence 15, and it begins by Moshe speaking up to Hashem. And Moshe makes a request. May Hashem, God of the spirit of all flesh, appoint a man over the assembly who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall take them out and bring them in. And let the assembly of Hashem not be like sheep that have no shepherd. Hashem said to Moshe, take to yourself Yoshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom there is spirit, and lean your hands upon him, be so mech, the idea of ordaining him, so to speak, 
You shall stand him before El Lazar, the Kohen. Aaron has already passed away, and before the entire assembly, and command him before their eyes. You shall place some of your majesty upon him, so that the entire assembly of the children of Israel will pay heed. And as we all know, foundational transition of leadership is a very unchartered territory and has many, many pitfalls and does not often happen very smoothly. Baruch Hashem, thankfully, as we read through the history of the Jewish people, this transition does work well. Now let's just pick up on a few nuances here. The most clear and obvious to me, the most eye-catching is the fact, is the words Moshe uses when he addresses Hashem as God of the spirits of all flesh, which in Hebrew is Hashem, the four-letter name of God of compassion, Elokei Haruchot Lechol Basar, which we translate here as the spirit of all flesh, the God of the spirit of all flesh. But Rashi says very specifically here, what does this mean? Rashi says, why is this written God of the spirits? What is Moshe alluding to? Moshe said before God, master of the world, the personality of each individual is revealed before you. They do not resemble one another. This is not a cookie cutter nation. Appoint a leader who can bear with each individual according to his personality. So Moshe's understanding of the role of the leadership of the Jewish people focuses on the leader's ability not to charismatically command blind faith, have people charge into the muskets ahead of them, which probably would be the description that many historical figures would say that that's what leadership requires, people who can throw aside all their personal differences and unite in some kind of totalitarian way, which we see the emphasis in China and in other countries trying to forge a nation in that way. But rather, it's the opposite of that. A leader who has multiple perspectives in mind all the time, who can see the world through other people's eyes. Of course, the most recent example of that in the section before is when the daughters of Tzalavchad approach Moshe and say, we're being left out. And Moshe could have dismissed them. We're on the verge of entering the land of Israel. We've got big stuff going on here. But instead, he listens to their complaint. And he says in a very heartfelt way, let me present it to God. Let me see how God responds to this. In other words, I may not personally be so sympathetic to your request to inherit your late father but perhaps God will be because you have a perspective there. You have a viewpoint and you're advocating responsibly and politely and through proper channels. You're not creating a revolt. You're not doing what Korach did going from tent to tent and screaming and yelling about how unfair Judaism is. You're approaching Jewish leadership in a thoughtful, direct way that merits consideration. I think this illustrates, it begins to illustrate this idea of what it means to be to be who, under, who understands God as having imbued individuality in a different mix of character traits and physical form and spiritual yearnings in each and every Jewish individual each one in the image of God, as all human beings are, but each one distinct and different in some way, and leadership means respecting that. Now, of course, the next sentence, you might think, totally contradicts that. Because what does it say? And let the assembly of Hashem not be like sheep that have no shepherd, which are described by the rabbis of Sheep just spreading out on the hillside. This sheep goes north, this sheep goes south, this sheep goes east, this sheep goes west. Just a free time. Everybody pursuing each sheep, so to speak, pursuing their own dream or inclination. But there's no cohesiveness. 
and there's no protection, there's no sense of community, and there's no sense of responsibility toward one another. So if I like a certain type of grass and it's all the way to the West, I'm gonna venture out there on my own. Of course, what happens to sheep like that very often, a wolf comes along and there's no more sheep. Also, let's say a pack of wolves come. If sheep can be herded and protected, the analogy used by the Medrash is who's watching out for the herd in general and saying it's a very sunny day. I need to bring them to the shady side of the hill. They're not, they're resistant to that because it looks so bright and biting here. But as their leader, as their caretaker, as someone responsible to see to it that these sheep survive and flourish and develop properly, I'm anticipating the risk, the physical risk, the spiritual risk involved. And I'm, I'm understanding the necessity of having B'nai Yisrael being the children of Israel with shared ideas and shared values. And in a manner that is understanding of all these different proclivities and natures, I'm still gonna shift the herd for its own sake over to this side or that side. And of course I do so in keeping with the dictates of God, in keeping with the Torah, in keeping with the value system as, as the leader is given to understand it so that the, the, so that the, the flock can flourish and be and 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 develop. So there's a tension involved. And this is a tension, I dare say, every family unit has this tension. And every family unit needs to look at it. My children are individuals. Yeah, it's great when they all decide when I go to buy them clothing and everybody says, yeah, I'll take the blue suit and I'll take the uh this and I'll take that and we can all eat the same food all the time, which different topic. We won't get into that which they should eat the same food because they should be able to amongst themselves decide things that they all like and can eat together so that they can share a meal together as much as possible, depending on the age and the, and the development. But this idea of there being individuality and yet the leader seeing, taking into account all these differences, making sure that the leader's not squashing anybody, but by the same token, that there's a unity of purpose and values that 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 are important and that are our legacy and that will bring us happiness and carry us through history all the way to the next extent. And I think the language of the Torah here is so beautiful and it's offering us an insight that we really need to focus on. A leader is a protector. You know, there's a midrash about Moshe chasing after one particular sheep that went its own way. And that's when he, how he encountered the burning bush because, because he was doing his job as a shepherd. One sheep lost its way. He was pursuing it. And that's what brought him to the burning bush, which just shows you this idea of respecting individuality and understanding the idea that you can have real, vibrant community, connection, family ties, and be individuals as well. And you can't take the shortcut of quashing individuality, teaching people not to think for themselves, not to feel for themselves in the course of trying to have community. But by the same token, it's a big task. It's not a simple thing to do. And it all will come from the sense of, of realizing that God Almighty is the spirit of all flesh. And that's the, that's the main viewpoint that a leader needs to have. And if you're leading a family, if you're leading, if you're participating in a marriage, this is what has to be navigated. This is what has to be looked through. And then the samachta es yodcha alav, what is Moshe told to do? Smicha, the famous thing of rabbinic ordination. In front of the public, Yoshua lowers his head. Maybe he was taller than Moshe, maybe he wasn't. And Moshe places his hands upon him. There's a sense of submission. There's a sense of, I'm accepting this legacy position of leadership in fulfillment of all the values that God is bestowing upon us. That's what has to be. That's, in my mind, the person who articulates this the most, or I shouldn't say the most, but a person who particularly articulates this 
is Rav Herschel Schachter, the Rosh Hashiva of Reitz and Yeshiva University. He's often quoted as saying, I understand my job is to take intact the beautiful legacy of Torah that I learned through Rabbi Soloveitchik and through my Rebbeim and through my father who was a Rosh Hashiva at YU and to see to it that I teach it and convey it in its entirety, positively, optimistically, to the next generation so that they will make it their own and so that they in their time will do what I'm doing and they will see to it that it's carried forward. The sense of <coughs> carrying forward values, carrying forward ideas is, is a big idea. And it's an idea that we have no, we have very little tolerance for in today's world. Why? We'll see that from the beginning of the Parsha, but simply because everyone's sincerity is knocked out of the box, you know? And today being July 4th, I think it's worth mentioning the idea that Thomas Jefferson in the launching of a revolutionary war against a power and a force on earth far more powerful than anything the colonists could have launched, saw to it that he wanted to codify the idea of equality, the idea of the dignity of all individuals in that founding document. You know, and as they say, mostly it lists complaints against the British government and their reasons for rebelling and declaring independence. And we understand that. But that was not the introduction that he wrote. So it was, oh, Thomas Jefferson, he owned slaves. Yes, he fell short, okay, in, in a secular enterprise. But, but does that therefore discredit the importance and the value of the ideas he put forward? And what I dare say here is that thankfully in our Jewish tradition, the leaders that we have even today, they're not perfect. They're not angels. They're not people without fault, but they are people who internally always strive. They set an example, questioning their themselves, questioning their own motivations, purifying themselves, studying themselves, being a student along with the rest of the Jewish people of Torah. And that's the idea of a Talmud Chacham, someone who's a, a wise student. It's not the professor. Of course, these are our sages. These are our chachamim. We defer to them. Yeshua lowers his head to Moshe. <clears throat> but the sense is that we are in this together and we all are human beings and we all have our faults. But the ideas that we received at Sinai, which were not manufactured out of human genius or human aspiration, but rather were placed before us by God Almighty, going back to Mount Sinai, we strive to align our inner selves with that purity. And we strive to live up to those values. And in doing so, in a humble way, in a way of saying, we're all working on it sincerely, that's how those values become clarified. That's how they're passed forward. That's how we sustain Jewish life from one generation to the other. And I just want to say right here that commonly we make a big mistake within families of what it means to be the parent. Now, many people are not responsible parents today. They're not willing to involve themselves with their children. I'm busy. I got my own problems. I don't like the way I look, so I'm not going to help my daughter navigate feeling confident and good about herself as she goes through the teenage years, because my plate is, is full with my own concerns. That's a big problem today. But when we set that aside, and when we look, especially when we want to pass forward a religious tradition, all of a sudden we become critics. All of a sudden we, we feel our goal is to notice flaws. And of course, in doing so, what are we doing? We're pushing our kids away from us. We're creating space. And they, believe me, they grab opportunities for space and they head out into this very uncharted world we live in today, where it can truly be said today, anything goes, anything, any idea goes. There's no such thing as wisdom carried forward from the past. There's no such thing with accumulated learning. After all, with the back of my hand, I can, I can delegitimize everything that's come before me. 
So I'm totally free. That's a void and a vacuum, which is so destructive to children. But we create that space and that vacuum by being seeing ourselves as primarily critics. I dare say that if we take the challenge of Moshe's words of leadership here, and we think of our job is to be in consonance with a God who is the God of the spirit of all flesh. My kid is an individual. He's nature and everything else is formed by Hashem. I have a job to build this child up, to show love, to show devotion, to show a path, a positive pathway forward. And yes, I see personal flaws. And yes, I see arrogance and I see selfishness and I see anger. I see them within myself as well. Who's kidding who here? So by setting an example of wanting to better myself and sharing my struggles appropriately at the right stage of life with my children, and by building my child and by bringing my child closer, and that's this idea that Rabbi Simcha Wasserman articulated once in my own home, where he said the classical model for parenting that the Talmud talks about is doche be be small or makarvo be a mean. Push your child away, meaning correct your child with your weaker hand and bring your child closer with your stronger hand. And the beautiful image that Rabbi Salavechik, that Rabbi Wasserman, Rabbi Simcha Wasserman, Zechat Sadek Obrocha said, is here's the idea. You're confronting your child. Your child's confronting you. And your child's saying, I don't believe in this, or this is not for me, or it's too restrictive, or I want to wear whatever clothing everybody else is wearing, or whatever the issue is. So your child is standing opposite you, and your child is challenging you. So, of course, you could become angry. You could belittle the child. You could call the child names. That's, that's God forbid, that's not part of the Jewish tradition whatsoever. So he said, if you push gently with your left hand and you pull close with your right hand, what you're really doing is you're turning the child around and slowly over time with by, by being an active, involved, engaged parent whose focus is the direction my child is going to take, the child becomes turned around and he's facing the same direction as you, the parent. What a beautiful model for us to hold on to even when we're angry, even when our kids annoy us, even when we think, oh my goodness, where did this kid come from? Whatever the challenge is at all these different stages, whether it's terrible twos <clears throat> or whether it's rebellious teenage years or it's kids having marriages that we're uncomfortable with, we can engage positively. We can find good to build on and we can build on it accordingly. And just to go back to the beginning of this week's Torah reading, just to look very clearly on how this idea comes forward again. The Torah, as I mentioned, is just concluding with, the, with what Pinchas did in last week's Torah reading, when he stood up and he zealously killed a fellow Jew. And the Torah identifies him as Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron Akohen. He's Pinchas. He's the son of Elazar, the very Kohen, who is going to supervise the transmission of leadership from Moshe to Aaron later in the Parsha, later in Jewish history. Why does the Torah go back to Bain Aaron? Because the debate in the community, and Rashi highlights this based on a medrash, was people after the fact said, look at that hothead Pinchas. Look what a hypocrite he is. Look how discredited he should be. He had the audacity to kill a leader of the Jewish people, a prince of the Jewish people. Yeah, he committed terrible things. It's true. Violation of Torah was disgusting. But he's a hypocrite. Why? Because in his lineage, his father, Elazar, was married to a descendant of Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law. And therefore, he has idolatry in his background. So he's discredited. He's a nobody. 
So along comes God and says, I want to talk to you about Pinchas, the son of Elazar, the son of Aaron Hakohe. Aaron, you know about him. He's a pure lover of peace. There's not a contentious bone in his body. He does everything he can to build up the people around him, to draw them close, to create peace between husbands and wives. There should be shown bias, to involve himself actively in settling every dispute amongst the Jewish people. That's the attribute, that's the inner motivation that animated Pinchas when he acted. It was only on behalf of the indignity to God's honor and to the honor of the Jewish people that he acted, out of love for the Jewish people, not out of hatred. And yes, you can murmur, you can criticize, you can point out <coughs> failings in his lineage. Maybe you could even find some failings within him himself, although the rabbis don't seem to say that that was highlighted. But understand what a fantastic act of peace and purity and seeking harmony this was. It was a positivity. It wasn't an act of disdaining of another person. It wasn't an act of vilifying another person. It was an act taken to say, oh, the Jewish people can't live in holiness with such an example, such a disgrace in front of them. I must take action. And he does take action. And he satisfies the issue of the Jewish people. We have to rely on this. And then I would, what I would point back to is a talk from the Rosh Hashiva of Chafetz Chaim that I heard when I was a very young student in the yeshiva. And the Rosh Hashiva then described, he said, we know from the rabbis that Noah, Noah was able to save himself and his family from the flood, but no one else in the world. Abraham was able to make a dent in the entire world as one, as a couple, he and his wife, standing up for ideas. Why was one so effective and one so ineffective? And he has a source that indicates because Avraham pointed out the light and the goodness and the uplift of good values. He wasn't the social critic. He didn't say, you're stealing from one another, you're murdering one another. There's no peace, there's no harmony, you're a bunch of idiots. He did not approach the world that way. He approached the world and said, you're children of God. God ultimately created you. God endowed you with a spiritual dignity and connection to God that could be built step by step by step over time. And there's magnificence in the world and there's holiness in the world. If only you'll pursue that, if only you'll see through the immediate gratification, the immediate sense of, Here's a God that I can touch and feel and I can worship. And that's what idolatry was. And the idea pushed that aside. Look how magnificent creation is. See through the short-term immediate situations. See, look within yourself and you'll see tremendous yearning for spirituality, yearning for greatness. We need to reach back to these ideas. We need to take the Parsha of Pinchas each of us as individuals, and say to ourselves, we are engaged in passing forward the legacy of Judaism and Torah. It's very precious. It's very special. It's not something that any one of us can do individually, but it's something that we can each undertake together by respecting the leadership of the Jewish people and trying to learn from that leadership. And we can use the example of Emotia to make space for the individuality of every person at the same time by and by and by doing so, doing so by building on the goodness inherent in every person, by finding that, by talking to the person that way, even at moments that are very, very trying, even at moments that are very, very difficult. And I'll just conclude with a story written about the Chazanish, which I've told here before, and that's this that once in his minion, when they were praying the morning prayers, a young father came with a young child, and during the course of the service, the child disturbed. And as soon as the prayers were over, the father took the child aside and, how do you act this way? You're embarrassing us. You're, you're, you're disrupting the service. I, I, I can't believe you acted this way. 
And after that episode was done, the Chazanish very gently called over the father and said to the father, you know, you taught your child two things today. Father was surprised. And one, you taught him, it's not nice to disturb the prayer service. Good for a person to cooperate, behave, be respectful of others. Said you also, the second lesson you taught your child is that when something annoys you or you feel it causes you embarrassment, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to lose yourself. It's okay to be cutting and demeaning of others. And then the Chazni said, looked him in the face and said very gently, of these two lessons, which lesson do you think will remain longer in the psyche and the being of your child? The importance of tefillah or the necessity for a person to deal with others respectfully and to calm their own personal anger and their own embarrassment and to say, okay, I have with me a young child who I can teach positively by example, how beautiful it is to go to a prayer service, how beautiful it is to dive into Hashem, how uplifting it can be to say these Psalms in the morning. And especially in the presence of a great man like the Chazonish, who was the leader of the Jewish people in Israel at the time. I can teach all this to my child, but of course I first need to show him the example that it's not about me, it's about you. It's not about me, the shepherd, being able to say, look how my flock travels in such good, pristine order from place to place, but rather look how each of my sheep are flourishing and developing and making progress and, rep and and fulfilling themselves and fulfilling the community of the Jewish people. That's the leader Moshe was looking for. We need to aspire to be that leader. And if you feel you're not a leader, okay, you may not be a leader of your community. You may not be a leader of the Jewish people. You're a leader of a family. You're setting an example for those others around you. You're, you're, you're forging an impression and an understanding that this is what it means to be concerned about carrying forward our Jewish heritage. A lot for us to think about. Hopefully we'll all think about it in a positive way.